Welcome, everyone. I am delighted that we have an exciting conversation this afternoon. Uh, this is a joint program with the Peoria Area World Affairs Council and Methodist College here in town. Today, our guest host is Tavi Gabor. Uh, Dr. Gabor is a professor of humanities at Methodist College. Take us away, Tavi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angela. And thank you very much at the same time, Methodist College. And thank you very much, Joanna, for, for being here. Uh, I will say a few words about Joanna before I do so. Uh, let me thank again um, Peoria Area World Affairs Council and at the same time Methodist College, uh, two institutions in Peoria, Illinois that uh, collaborate well together and at the same time who also make all of us uh, participate, make all of us participate in events like that. Uh, with Joanna, who is now uh, in Romania, in Fagaraj, a small town in Romania, in Transylvania. Uh, Angela is in DC, I am in DC as well, and the majority of you are in Peoria. So thank you all. Uh, let me say a few words about Joanna. Joanna is a uh, historian slash journalist. She, she worked as a journalist for BBC Romania and Radio France Internationale. Uh, afterwards, uh, after she discovered uh, some history in her own family that she will talk about today, she started to slightly switch her career. She went to CEU, Central European University in Budapest, to do a master's degree in history over there. And since then, she has published various articles uh, about the topic that she will discuss today. And at the same time, she's working, I don't know if she wants me to say that or not, but I will say nevertheless, uh, she, works, uh, on, she works on a book on a... Uh, Yana, graphic you novel, you graphic volume, there you go, a graphic no history novel, so to say, right, uh, about the history of her family. We are delighted to have her here, so uh, Joanna, thank you very much again for coming, and uh, we look forward to what you have to say. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I will uh, just uh, jump into the topic. I will share my screen, so just let me know if this is working, and I hope you can all see Sure. Well, oh, if you give yeah. me just one moment at the same time, uh, I wanted to remind all of you that uh, I, I forgot to mention how the discussion will go ahead. So Yona will have a presentation, then I will have a certain dialogue with her, and then we'll open up to questions. Uh, please write your questions anytime in the chat. I will check the chat at all times, and I will I will ask your own questions. Uh, I'm also want to say I'm delighted to see that in the list of participants there are former students that I had in class. Well, actually, some of them uh, know Joanna because Joanna was uh, Joanna helped me organize a trip in Romania for a class at Methodist College, Suffering and Forgiveness, and we went over there a few years ago. And I see one student at least who was with us in that trip and who is here now as well. So, hello to all of you. Okay, I'm also happy that uh, at least somebody that I know is here besides you. Uh, I will just share my screen and let me know it. Yeah. Is it working? So you can see my presentation. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Oh, I can switch to the next. I will start by showing a photograph. Uh, that is very important for uh, the topic and that might give you an idea about uh, what I will be talking about. Uh, what you see is a wedding photograph and uh, actually it's what it remained from uh, a wedding photograph. Maybe you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, it's a torn apart photograph and what you can see on the right side is a tablecloth actually on which this uh, photo was laying at the moment when I photographed it. Why am I showing it at the beginning? Because uh, it was a very important uh, moment in my research uh, when I realized that a single visual artifact, if you want to see this photograph as such, uh, can be seen as the image of the Romanian society after communism. It shows a split family that I'll be talking about uh, more a bit later. And it's at the same time a testimony on the violent intervention of the political police in the life of a family, but also in the life of a community, because this is not a, I mean, it's a particular story, but it happens so many times that you can see it as a repetition. And the man that is missing 
um, disappeared from the family, from the life of his family, in the same way in which he disappeared from this photograph. Um, when I went to interview this woman, she was 90 years old, and this was after the fall of communism, some years after. And I asked her if she has anything um, that remained from her husband because she, she couldn't remember anything. She told me that it happened so long ago. I cannot, I, I don't know what to tell you. I cannot tell you anything. And uh, at the beginning I said, okay, let's take it slowly, show me something. And she said, my daughter, my daughter can bring something. She can bring a photo. And her daughter actually came with this photograph showing, uh, telling me that I have this photo. I have only one photograph with my parents together. And she came with this, holding it very carefully. And um, they bent over it and they started to talk about him. Uh, we were actually seeing two different things. I was looking at this part of the photograph and I was seeing a woman and they were looking at it and they were seeing the man, the man that is missing. You can trace his legs. I hope you can see his shoes. And it was a very, it was the beginning of a very long interview, of actually a longitudinal interview. Many times I returned to this family and uh, I talked about him and about his story. He left in the mountains, uh, becoming part of the resistance against communism. He was executed in the end. And uh, he died without uh, meeting, uh, his second child, a girl that the woman was bearing when he left. I will get back to this photo a bit later, but I just wanted to introduce the topic uh, in a sense by showing with this photo and uh, giving you an image of how the Romanian society and how some Romanian families and communities uh, felt and looked after communism short outline of the discussion. As Tavi said a bit earlier, uh, I'll have like a, maybe 15 minutes uh, presentation, a bit of context, and then we'll talk a bit uh, about the legacy of communism and this transgenerational trauma, because I think this is at stake, at least from my perspective, when we talk about recent past, why are we studying? Why do, do we want or do we need to know it? Because it's within us in a way or another. And in order to, um, I don't know, to get in contact with our identity and to uh, understand who we are, we need to know uh, what this past brings to us. Um, at the beginning, you have uh, a photograph with uh, yeah, the map of Romania with some dots that actually are crosses. Uh, they show places where people died during communism. They can be prisons, political prisons, uh, labor camps. We had ch uh, prisons for women, prisons for intellectuals, prisons for peasants, a prison for children. Yes, uh, the youngest was uh, 12. Uh, some of them, most of the children, of course, survived, um, but uh, it's not the case of the others. Uh, one cross is not one person, it's one place. It can be one common grave in some cases or one prison. Uh, you have here a quotation from a Romanian dissident who found it the only memorial of, uh, for the victims of communism in Romania. She said something that is relevant to this topic. The greatest victory of communism was to create people without memory. A brainwashed new man, unable to remember what he was, what he had, or what he did before communism. The creation of the memorial is means of uh, counteracting this victory, a means to resuscitate the collective memory. Uh, why I said it's important? Because uh, I showed you this uh, split photograph and how a person disappeared from an image and uh, from the life of his family. Um, 
she, Anna Bladiana, but also many Romanian researchers talk about the Romanian society as a person without memory or a collective, if you want, <laughs> character without memory, as if uh, we had Alzheimer's. And we wake up every day uh, wondering who we are, what we lived. Some of these people who lived during communism disappeared from our memory and from their families and their communities. In the same way, this part of the photograph disappeared. Nobody knows. It was torn apart by a political uh, uh, police officer during a house search in 52. Maybe he just destroyed the part. Nobody knows. So nobody found it in, I don't know, in the files of the political police that now are open to researchers. Um, so for us, from the perspective of the Romanian society who lived communism, it's a, um, an attempt to recover our identity and to connect to ourselves. On the right side, under the map you have, below the map you have uh, just a few historical uh, notes for context. Romani uh, communism was installed in Romania in uh, 46 through falsified elections. Um, it was a process of Sovietization. So maybe most of you know that Europe was split after the Second World War and uh, um, there was a Sovietization of a part of Europe. Um, it was one of the harshest political repressions in Romania. Up to 2 million people were persecuted out of uh, I don't know exactly, 15 million, I think maybe we had at the time. And the communist regime, maybe this is relevant, was officially condemned in Romania in 2006 as criminal and illegitimate. Just a few words about uh, the beginning of communism in Romania, something that was striking to me when I found out is related to the military oath during communism. And uh, this is a quotation, uh, I swear to hate from the bottom of my being all the enemies of the country and of the workers. This I think is the beginning of a split and the polarization and division. It was us and the enemies of the country. The enemies were, of the country were uh, Romanians. We were talking, uh, they were talking about internal enemies. And um, anybody who was against the regime was an enemy of the country, actually, at the time. It followed on abolishing of human rights and freedoms, anything that you can think of in terms of human rights and freedoms, like freedom of speech and movement, freedom of opinion and expression, freedom from torture, the right to property, the right to pro pri uh, privacy. Um, there was, at the time, uh, a quotation from the head of the political police saying that um, we are the law but we shall turn the law as we please and this is maybe representative this was an official statement you open the microphone Davi, or no i mistake forgive me ah, okay i thought you wanted to say something i'm not uh, seeing the chat by the way so if there are questions related to what i'm saying okay but you can interrupt me at any point. Uh, again, I'm showing a map of Romania where you can see some places where armed resistance took place. I said before that this was the installing of communism. We had falsified elections. We had this rule of hatred and abolishing of human rights. And then, of course, as a natural consequence, I guess, we had resistance. Uh, people couldn't take it and they formed uh, groups of resistance. We had armed resistance uh, formed mainly by men, but not exclusively. And maybe this is interesting to point out. Uh, it was like, um, we don't know exactly actually how many groups, but uh, they were hiding in the mountains. They had guns. There were clashes between them and the political police. So, troops that were sent uh, to find them and kill them. Um, in terms of political agenda, because maybe you are wondering what they were doing in these mountains, 
uh, they hoped for the American interventions against uh, the Soviets. So at the time, now I know it seems so, uh, maybe it sounds weird, but at the time uh, people were thinking that a third world war is very possible and imminent. And they were thinking and hoping, I think that uh, the Americans would fight the Soviets. This, this never happened and now we know and we can understand even why. But at the time, they were uh, very uh, serious about this, let's say. During my research, I found an interesting report uh, for the, uh, the American president, Harry Truman, by CIA. Um, they sent, they had their people behind the Iron Curtain, not only in Romania, and they were searching for information now of course this doesn't mean that they wanted to start another war but uh, they were interested on how this sovietization of eastern europe is taking place and uh, to what extent there is any resistance and it was interesting i just took a few uh, phrases from the report uh, they talk about the absolute uh, power of the police power of the government and they point out to the fact that that penalty was introduced in the Romanian penal code, which is a very important aspect. And their conclusion was at the time that the coordination of various groups and the formation of coherent resistance are impossible uh, in that conditions. Now, it happened in these impossible conditions. Uh, there was resistance and uh, today we are researching uh, how this was possible. And uh, I will talk a bit uh, about the Pogarash group. Pogarash is this very small town at the bottom of uh, the tallest mountains in Romania, where some people, some men, uh, between them was the man, uh, the missing man from the first photograph, were hiding, uh, forming an armed resistance group, hoping that there will be a political turn that will give them the chance to fight against the Soviets who are taking the power in Romania at the time. Um, they had this geographical advantage. This is a real photo of the Fogarash Mountains and they resisted around eight years, which is a lot. They were just a few and uh, there were hundreds and thousands of soldiers during these years, sent to catch them. Uh, just to give you an um, idea about the political repression, I picked a random year, not necessarily random, it was maybe by the peak of the resistance, 1952. On the one side, you have 12 men in the mountains. It was only 12, their best times. And on the other side, you had hundreds of uh, official informants I don't know how familiar is this term to you. This meant that the political police paid like salaries. So they were hired. It was like a job. And they were paid monthly to give him for any kind of information uh, that could lead to the man in the mountain. But it could be really anything. They were not, I found uh, the bills and they were really paid for all sorts of fantasies in some of the cases. All villages in the area, around 100 villages, were under permanent surveillance. This meaning that um, there were house searches and uh, uh, officers from the Securitate, which is the name of the Romanian political police, uh, in the village, living in the village. They sent soldiers, they used dogs, they used the military helicopters, they had police stations in every village, and I didn't write here, but they used uh, um, undercover microphones in the house of the people who were suspected to be in touch with uh, those in the mountains. Uh, because I said that women were not generally part of the uh, resistance in the mountains. I want to say a few words about women and women's role uh, because I uh, research particularly this aspect 
precisely because they are a bit overlooked. It's true that most of them were not in the mountain, and in the case of the Fogarage group, no woman was actually a member of uh, uh, the group. But um, many of them were in the supporting network. And without them, um, it's a fact uh, that can be proven, the resistance in the mountains uh, wouldn't have looked in the way it looks today. They were followed, interrogated, they offered support, they offered food, they offered information. Some of them even managed to find and offer guns for the men in the mountains. Um, here in the image you have Elisabetta Riza, who was a peasant and uh, who became after the 90s a symbol of armed resistance, although he, he never, she never was uh, part of the group in the mountains, but she supported them and she was arrested for several times and she never gave information, although she knew where they were and uh, when they were meeting and stuff like this. Uh, a so-called category, although I don't like the word category and I don't want to put them in categories, are the wives of the so-called bandits. The political police was calling them bandits. In this photograph, you can see my grandmother and my grandfather. It's again a wedding photograph, but uh, in this case, you can see him. Uh, and I can tell you also why, actually. You can see because uh, he hid the photograph in the attic of their house and my father, so their son, found it 60 years later. And uh, it was in a good shape and in this way it was the first time that we could see them together. He was part of the group in the mountains and uh, Davin mentioned that I have a pers personal connection to the topic. This is the connection. Uh, my grandfather joined the group in the mountains shortly after he got married. Actually two years after he got married. He had already, he was um, the father of a girl who was two at the time and his wife, my grandmother, was uh, pregnant with a second child, my father. She was a widow for almost 60 years. She died two years ago, uh, aged 90. Uh, and she was, in a sense, uh, a symbol of this, at least to me, of these women who are persecuted not only during the resistance, but also after, until the fall of communism, and who had to raise alone the children while facing the wrath of the political police that were still considering her the wife of the bandit. I'm saying these things after I read the political police files on their names. Another whole category is the children of the bandit and I'm introducing them because uh, I mentioned at the beginning the legacy of communism and at the same time uh, the transgenerational trauma that was passed down to the second and the third generation in some cases. This is a photograph uh, of my father and uh, his sister on the left side. Uh, and uh, this is the last message that my grandfather, so their father, sent to somebody else, to his wife, tell her to forgive me and to raise the children as God will help her. He saw the boy in this photograph only once after he was born and it was not a very uh, happy encounter because um, the Seguridad found out that he came in the village to see him. He was a newborn the time and uh, he simply wanted to see his child and he came from the mountain although it was risky hoping that he will manage to run back before they find him. It didn't happen somebody saw him and told uh, the police so house search uh, followed he managed to leave but she was arrested and um, this was, I think, a key moment or a crucial moment in her life because after that she said that uh, since then she couldn't laugh and she couldn't cry, no matter what happened. She didn't give a lot of details, but uh, I know that she was arrested for a few days. Of course, she didn't do anything. She, there was no uh, 
official legal papers around this arrest. She was just taken and uh, they were even using this term. They are taking them and then releasing them because it was actually an illegal uh, arrest or an arrest that couldn't be, that wasn't even registered. Maybe this shows also a gender perspective of the regime or the gender stereotypes. If you want, women didn't really have files on their names. Although she was arrested, she was seen, I think, somehow as an extension, extension of her man. And uh, she was the tool to which he could be caught. She didn't know anything about him. He came to see his son and uh, he left. Uh, she, she told me, because I was also curious, and she mentioned several times that, of course, uh, they didn't talk about where were you hiding, where were you staying, on which mountain, on which top, where are you going when you leave home. I'm getting back to the photograph that I uh, showed at the beginning, uh, just to show you the man. He was born in the US, actually, in Ohio. Many Romanians uh, left the country in the interwar period and went to work in the US and then they returned. He returned to the country when he was uh, four, I think, with his parents. And then he got married. He was um, an educated man that lived for a while in the capital of Romania and worked at one of the, I think, the agriculture ministry department. And after that, he returned in his home village and uh, got married with this woman. He was my grandfather's best friend, actually, and uh, I went to, to meet her when she was almost 90. Uh, and I was a bit uh, stressed, let's say, because I knew that he left because of my grandfather. He helped my uh, grandfather, he offered him shelter and food and information and at some point uh, the security the political police find out and he had no choice he had to leave i mean he had a choice to stay and to be arrested or to leave and uh, i knew that they had uh, they were announced that he is on the blacklist and they had a night to decide she was pregnant in the same way my grandmother was pregnant with my father it was it's uh, like a copy-paste story. And uh, until morning, they decided that he should leave. And this was actually the last time he saw her, the last time uh, he saw his uh, daughter, who was two, and he never met the child that she was bearing when he left. The photograph uh, remained with them, and they just kept it like this, torn apart. But what is amazing uh, is that uh, one, two years ago, I think, uh, somebody who came, I had an exhibition in uh, Pogarash about women of resistance particularly, and I used this photo. And this woman uh, was still alive at the time, and uh, she came on the exhibition with her daughter. And a while after, somebody called them and told them that, look, I have this photo, and this is the photo. And it was uh, glued on a family album. You can see on the screen that it has some holes. They just deglue it. They took it out from the album and they ruined it a bit. They were so excited that basically they ruined it uh, in the process. <laughs> but this is less important. Uh, you can see the man. And they finally got the photo. They were at the wedding. They were friends. And they were at the wedding and they received as a, after the wedding as a souvenir. Uh, a photo of the bride of the group. Um, for them, it was uh, something amazing that they could finally see him. Um, but at the same time, um, it was something natural, maybe it sounds weird in the sense that for them, he was always there, he was always present. And uh, this was the very interesting experience uh, that uh, showed me or that I don't know. Let me be a wit let me be a witness of the uh, healing process, but also of the trauma that they lived during this time. They were seeing him when he was not there, uh, but he disappeared from their life, and uh, even his body disappeared from 
this world without leaving traces, in a sense. They don't have anything from him. They don't have uh, uh, papers, they don't have photographs. So he doesn't have a grave. He was executed together with his best friend, my grandfather, some years after uh, this house search. And uh, it remained this only, the split image of the family. I will uh, end with this idea of the generation of post memory. It's a term coined by Marianne Hirsch, who is actually born in Romania to a Jew family. They emigrated from the US, I think, in the 60s. And uh, she introduced this term, post memory, saying that it's a specific kind of memory that passes information about traumatic events from previous generations to the next ones. Now, maybe some of you, it's not very new, are familiar with the term. It's used in the field of memory, also researched a lot uh, in neurosciences. And apparently there is uh, evidence that uh, traumatic information leaves a chemical mark on our DNA and can be passed down to the next generations. She coined it in relation to the children of Holocaust survivors. And then, of course, it started to be used in several other contexts. The pink photo is uh, with me and uh, my brother's kids, actually, not mine. And on the right side, you have my grandmother uh, standing and uh, my parents, my father and uh, my mother. This is her home house, the entrance to her home house, where she returned after uh, after she was forced to divorce, actually, by the political police. Uh, and uh, she returned to her parents, who had her until the end, to the end of their lives, to help to raise her children. And this is another photograph of my grandma's house. You can see her, you can see Tavi and uh, some American students who visited us some years ago. I don't remember exactly the year, that would be. 2015. Okay, yeah, so some years ago. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think she was, uh, you, maybe you can see that she's a bit, I don't know if embarrassed or, uh, um, she, I think she was never aware of, uh, I don't know, neither her uh, trauma nor the importance of the historical events that she was part of. I think that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's more than, yeah, it's then it's more than 15 minutes. Maybe we can continue the dialogue and then check the chat. There are some... Yes, thank you very much, Joanna. In fact, uh, there are already questions on the chat. Many of them are from my students, so it makes me very proud of them. But I will ask you first the question, and I will, in the questions I will ask, I will use the questions I have on the chat. So you talk to us about the story that includes your family, and usually people find out about the stories of their family from their own family. But I think in your case, uh, the situation was different. That is, you found out about the story with your grandfather from people who were not in your family. And then afterwards, uh, you did your research about it. So you found out from in a public context, and then you found out more from your grandmother and so on afterwards. Could you, could you say more about how you found out and what it meant to you in your life? Yeah, uh, maybe it's weird that I didn't learn anything about this from my family, but uh, I think uh, in many cases of traumatic memories, this happens. And I found out later that not only my parents and grandmother uh, were unable to talk about what they lived, but many of those who lived this trauma were not able to talk, I think not only to their family, but uh, not themselves and uh, about what they lived. And maybe this is the definition of trauma. They couldn't integrate it in their own past and they didn't have a narration from their for their own <laughs> biographies so in a sense I don't know if this, this makes sense. Uh, I found out during a weird encounter uh, with one of the survivors of the 
resistance group that my grandfather was uh, part in. It was uh, the summer after I finished high school, I graduated high school and uh, I took a summer job at a local newspaper and one day an old man just came in looking for somebody else and I was the only one but that day of the newsroom and he came to me but he was acting very weird from the beginning uh, it was we never met before this was clear I had no idea whom he was because he didn't say he just asked me if the editor-in-chief was there and at some point, uh, I noticed that he's a bit uh, shaken, I don't know, in a way. He asked me, what's your name? And I told him, and then he started to cry, and he told me, you have your grandfather's eyes. So I thought he was mistaking me. I don't know, he's making a mistake and or taking me for somebody else. And he said, you know, your grandfather from the mountains. I was a good friend of your grandfather in the mountains mountains okay he lives in a village close to the mountains but i had no idea what you're talking about I said okay slowly we will you will you will learn so this was my first encounter in a sense with my grandfather actually through him i or through the fact that he was re-encountering my grandfather through me i also met my grandfather during this uh, weird encounter and there is a question about uh, how you personally felt, how you personally felt about uh, about this issue when you found out. What did it mean to you personally, if you can talk about it? Well, I I cannot recall exactly what I felt at the moment. I think confusion would be the first word. I really didn't understand anything <laughs> about this. I had no idea. I knew that uh, my father's father died when he was young. But uh, dying and being executed are different things, yeah. Uh, it, it was confusion combined with curiosity. Um, then, um, I don't know, eagerness of learning very fast everything. And uh, after I realized uh, what happened, I mean, he told me, okay, grandfather resistance, mountains, died, executed. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, wow, I need to know everything. Uh, it was a very long process <laughs> of maybe 20 years during which step by step, I, I know I put together a puzzle and I learned this, uh, the whole story and the history behind it because it's, this is micro history um, and uh, it fits in a larger context. Uh, I felt anger at some point, uh, if you want to talk at the personal level. Uh, I, I don't know, it was many stages that I went through during this process. But I felt that I'm, um, I don't know, I, I was like, not interviewing people, I took maybe a comfortable role, the role of a researcher, which enabled me to step back a bit and to say, okay, I'm a researcher, I'm finding information about a historical event, but from time to time it was overwhelming because this historical event was actually a big part of my family and of my identity. And slowly, slowly, I realized that this uh, amnesia that they were uh, living was actually traumatic amnesia and sometimes they were saying i don't know i don't remember and my grandmother for instance i went to her several times and i asked her stuff and she said i i don't remember this i don't know um, and at the beginning i thought that they don't don't want to tell me but uh, then i learned that they cannot tell because they cannot formulate because they never did this and slowly i was with them while, while they were narrating creating a narration around this trauma and they were integrating and this is why i mentioned a bit earlier that uh, i went through longitudinal interviews with several families not only mine uh, i contacted the descendants of all people who are part of the group and uh, step by step year by year 
returning to them, I realized that um, they changed their own narration about what happened because they can uh, recall memories, more memories. And we were somehow exchanging pieces of information and creating this puzzle together. I needed them to give me this information that I couldn't find in the political police files. And they needed me to give them information from the political police files about their own lives, about moments that uh, they could never understand because they were simply missing information. They were surveyed all, all the times and there were created all sorts of scenarios around them and they never knew who, uh, what is true, what is fake, uh, uh, what is, uh, who is to trust and who is an informant. Thank you. Uh, there are several questions. I will try to organize them in, in categories, so to say. Okay. You already talked about the fact that you talked to other people about this history. There was quite one question about this. So one category of questions, if I can put it this way, is about the lives of the people who remain home. So not the people who went into the mountains, but people like your grandmother and the wives of the other uh, people, mem uh, members of the group or the, fa or the parents and so on. Uh, what happened to them while they were in the mountains and what happened to them once they were executed? Because uh, I think you mentioned that all of them were executed except uh, two of them, if I am not mistaken. Yeah, except uh, two of them. Well, now I remember that I can show you actually. This is the man that I met, the survivor of the group uh, that I was talking about before. These are some photographs taken by the political police um, officers surveilling him after he was caught and released. So he was just walking on the streets doing his job with his business and they took photographs that are archived in political police files that now can be researched. Uh, okay, so uh, these two moments in time, while the resistance was still active, um, the families of uh, the partisans, they were called like this, uh, were surveilled step by step. That's why they couldn't meet actually with their families uh, and uh, the families were not the main supporters because it was too dangerous to meet them. Uh, as an example, in my grandmother's uh, household, not really house, uh, there was always a securitate officer, either in the garden or in the shelter for the animals or in the courtyard somewhere there was and she knew he was not uh, like just walking around he was allegedly hidden but sometimes they were meeting uh, this was uh, on the one hand on the other hand they were arrested and interrogated violent violently i don't know they were using uh, torture and they were beating them literally during inquiries after they were executed um, there were two survivors. One of them, the man that you see now, was never was not caught until seventy six, uh, meaning that the Securitate was still uh, looking for him, and uh, people were still persecuted in order to say if they met him, if they know where he's hiding, if he returned home or in his village or to relatives or to the families of the others who were killed and so on. Um, and there was also a social aspect to it. Uh, they were seen as outcasts of the society. My grandmother, for instance, couldn't find uh, a job and her children couldn't uh, go to school at some point. I mean, they finished high school and after that they wanted to uh, register for BA studies and uh, they were rejected as being children of the bandit. This was happening like uh, almost 15 years after he was killed. And it continued in a way or another until the fall of communism. And they were isolated, people were afraid to help them, to talk to them. They isolated themselves because this is what they lived their whole life. If, does it answer to the question? Yes, yes, thank you. And what about the group itself? So during these years when they were in the mountains, what were they doing, so to say? Were they certain, were they uh, hiding in a certain place? Were they moving from place to place? What was their 
uh, let's say activity, if I can call it this way. They were mainly hiding, but uh, not hiding in a place. They were everywhere and nowhere. They were in a continuous movement, precisely because they were uh, looked after and uh, the Securitate really used a lot of people and uh, they had, uh, as I mentioned, helicopters, dogs, and so on. Um, they were trying not to have fights with the Securitate because of the unequal forces. They were just a few men with guns remaining from the Second World War that were not really properly working by the end of the resistance. Um, and also they mentioned uh, the survivors in their memoirs, so some ethical and religious uh, reasons. They were not, uh, their goal was not to kill soldiers. Their goal was to resist, really to resist, to manage to survive. It was a survival fight from some point on because of the lack of resources mainly, including food. <laughs> Um, until this political situation would raise up and they could really fight to turn the regime and to return to the life, to the political life before communism was installed, which never happened, of course. And they realized it at some point, but uh, there was no way back. They Thank were you. all condemned, maybe this is important, they were all condemned in absentia in the 50s uh, to death. Yeah. Um, there is there is another category of questions, so to say, about Romania's relations nowadays with uh, with its neighboring countries. Uh, one question is asking about the relationship between Romania and Hungary, especially in the context of of uh, the source of contention, as Robert calls it, which is Transylvania. Uh, as you remind uh, in the question, uh, initially in World War II. Um, after the treaty between the Soviets and the, and the Nazis, uh, Transylvania was taken by Hungary and then uh, later reclaimed back by Romania. And Robert is asking what the relation is between these two countries now, if there is any kind of lingering bitterness. And there's another question having to do with Ukraine. But if you want to talk about this relationship first, I can go this way. Or if you want, me, if you want to talk about Ukraine as well, uh, that's fine. Uh, either um, way, uh, it just shortly, because it, it's not necessarily related to communism and it's yeah. a bit, uh, it opens up uh, another a total <laughs> different topic, mm -hmm. uh, if I might say this. Um, Romania was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for a long time and uh, on the one hand, so it's uh, a bit another historical context. Uh, and on the other hand, um, it's about nowadays uh, politics and the way this uh, topic is uh, used by politicians. Used and abused. <laughs> um, so if you, I, I live in Transylvania, I lived here for my whole, not my whole life, but uh, that my childhood. And uh, as a BBC journalist, I remember that at some point while this topic was uh, more abused than used uh, on the political scene, uh, I went to make some reports in the areas where many Hungarians live. And um, this was the conclusion then, and I think it's uh, still valid uh, after so many, uh, I mean, in hundreds of years of uh, inter-ethnic communities and mixed families. Uh, at a very low level, people live together like this for half a century and uh, the bitterness, it's not so much uh, at a small scale, but uh, on the political scene. I don't know if this was the answer that uh, he was looking for, but... Thank you. And I will continue with the, with, even if it's still not necessarily about the topic, but I will continue about the relationship that Romania has nowadays with its neighboring countries. Uh, so the other question is about Ukraine. Uh, Joanny uh, actually visited Romania a while ago and she enjoyed uh, your wonderful Transylvania, but she's asking what the relationship right now of Romania is with Ukraine. Is it a guarded relationship? Uh, do they enjoy it? <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about this as well. Um, yeah, sorry, I was uh, I was reading uh, a bit further the questions. Um, 
yeah, it depends on how you see it. If you talk about the relationship to Ukraine in relation to the recent past or uh, to the political uh, final policies or agreements between states and uh, diplom at the diplomatic level, or yeah, I'm not sure in which direction <laughs> to go with the answer. Yeah, well, we can come back with it if we have time because yeah, I maybe, if you yeah. do not mind. I, I will. Well, there's another question about the relationship between yeah, yeah. Romania yeah. and Russia, which is even a more Wait, complicated we, issue. We, we enter uh, now uh, a bit another field. Yes, um, but I will come back to trauma. Yeah, uh, Romania, I, I'll, I'll get back to trauma. Maybe, uh, yeah, the recent past uh, plays a very important role in the relationship between Romania and Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's obvious, of course, we are not. Uh, uh, it was a traumatic Sovietization and very violent Sovietization of Romania. And uh, so in Romania, there is not uh, so much uh, nostalgia about uh, this period or less nostalgia than in other ex-communist countries because of the trauma that is involved in the story. And uh, this uh, has an effect on the relationship of Romania and Russia, but it depends again, if you are talking about the diplomatic relationship or the view of the people on Russia, um, those, I don't know which kind of ties you are envisioning. I saw a question on trauma. Yeah. Are you, are you uh, still dealing with your family trauma today? Do you consider your family knowing... a burden? Correct. So knowing what happened, you know, is it a burden in your life? Um, if, makes sense. if it's a burden what happened or if it's a burden that I know what happened? The, I think that you know that happened in the sense that, you know, it changed. The fact that you found mm -hmm. out about it, does it represent a burden in your life? Knowing it's never a burden, if you ask me. Not knowing it's a burden in itself, regardless what happened. Uh, it is a burden what happened, but uh, knowing it, it's better than not knowing it because uh, it has, this trans transgenerational trauma has uh, effects regardless if you like it or not, if you know it or not. So I think it's better to know it and in this way you can heal it or at least heal a part of it and try to break the circle and not to uh, pass it down to the next generation. And oh. this this is at stake and this is why I think it's good to know it. And also it's part of my identity. I prefer to know who I am and what I'm bearing, even if it's uh, overwhelming mm -hmm. at some point. So I, I will ask in this case what I think is it's a difficult question, but nevertheless, I think it's connected with what you just said, um, that knowing it somehow you can repair the trauma. So one question says, what have you done personally to heal this trauma in yourself or in others? Did it make sense? Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Um, it's a difficult question because the process, uh, it's an ongoing process. So I, uh, there were different stages and I, I think I mentioned before that uh, there was a moment of uh, anger and uh, there were moments when I felt overwhelmed. There were and there are moments when I wish it were different. Um, I think it's, uh, it's continuing. Uh, somebody asked, do you think uh, transgenerational trauma will continue to be apparent in your family in the coming years? Uh, probably yes. And uh, most probably a part of it, uh, it's transmitted uh, without my uh, knowledge, maybe, of course, uh, also without my wish, uh, to my children. Uh, because it's linked also to behaviors and to hidden fears. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, there are parts of it that I haven't discovered yet. So without knowing, I'm just... Uh, passing them down to my kids. But at the same time, it's an opportunity while knowing it to heal what I can in me so that uh, 
the next generation will have to kill less, a bit less. Okay. I will ask another question coming from a student. Uh, is the event of communism talked about in schools? Uh, or is it the part of history? So is it part of the curriculum, so to say? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, yes and no. It is part of the curricula, but it's an optional. So not only that you can take it or not, there are schools that are not offering it. Of two years you know ago. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you know Sorry. why? Can you have an explanation of why? Yes, I have, <laughs> because uh, we are still uh, scratching the surface uh, of this period in terms of research. And also because, uh, yeah, it's a chain of uh, things. Uh, not many teachers have access to sources. Uh, they don't have time and they, they didn't, they were not trained to teach this period. Uh, then uh, some of them were uh, maybe well during communism and it's an uncomfortable topic for some. Uh, some were uh, more than well, were part of the state apparatus. And this is even more uncomfortable. So I think uh, we need to pass some more generations. But uh, it's possible to do it. For instance, two years ago, I returned to my hometown and uh, I have a project with a small NGO and uh, I'm teaching for history to gymnasium children in some of the villages around Fugarash. So if you want to do it, you can do it, but not always you will meet people that want to do it and can do it. Thank you. Uh, there, there is a comment actually from Dr. Shenderson, who's the chancellor of the college, who loves the, uh, the, the pictures you have and the fact that you were able to preserve your family history. And in connection with, with that, uh, if you don't mind talking more about your, your own pictures from your family, because if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the pictures you have of your grandfather, Young, you did not receive it from your family, but you actually brought it to your grandmother. And I don't know about this one, uh, the one from the... Yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, I can show both. There you go. Uh, yes. This is the only photograph of my grandfather that uh, we had for a very long time. So after I found, uh, after this weird encounter with the man uh, who survived, um, I went home and I wanted, among other things, to see a photo of him. And everybody told me that we have no photo. And uh, after some years, I think uh, one of his sisters uh, took out from the, this photo was sued on the back of an icon. So it was hidden like this during communists because they were afraid that during a house search that they might take it or destroy it. So, and so I met also, I could uh, link a visual image to the story. And this was the man, it was taken before the starting of communism. This is a second photo of him taking uh, when he was arrested. You can see maybe the difference. It's, I think it's 10 years difference. It's not such a long time. Sometimes I checked photos, my own photos. <laughs> uh, 10, years, 10 years difference, yeah, it's not. Um, I look more or less the same. Um, you can see his eyes. You can see, yeah, the skinny face. Uh, you can guess uh, maybe some emotions. Uh, this was taken uh, immediately after his arrest uh, when he knew that everything is over and he won't see his family and he will die. Um, I found this photograph in the political uh, police files uh, and I brought it home. I was a bit naive because I didn't think um, about the effect and I used it um, for some workshop, workshops with children, just showing visual images and let's interpret and let's see what do they transmit to you and who are these people, how what they looking, blah, blah. And uh, my grandmother just uh, saw, I had a collage actually using uh, the photo on the left and this. 
and my grandmother saw it. It was uh, very big, a three print. And uh, she said, okay, this is Gita. She was calling him like this. His name was Georgi. Uh, but who's the, the other one? And I realized, wow, she cannot, uh, <laughs> she doesn't realize that it's him, that it's the same. She never saw him like this. And of course it was a matter of uh, maybe seconds. I don't remember because time stopped also for me at that uh, point. And uh, I didn't say anything because I didn't know, I didn't expect this, that she will ask me who is this. And of course she realized, she realized and she started to cry, I didn't say anything. I, I just realized that uh, this was not very careful of me to just uh, display these photos around. And, that she might have a shock. I had no idea that, uh, I think it was uh, part of this uh, traumatic trauma that she was refusing. I don't think that she didn't know who he was when she saw the image, but she couldn't accept this image because uh, this was her husband. And this was the man who was arrested after being away for almost uh, eight years, actually. Uh, the man that she couldn't see for, again, seven, six, seven years, the man who eventually left the family, this was the last, the last image. So yeah, this was uh, the photograph that I used and uh, to show you some nicer photographs uh, that were found in the attic. I told you that uh, my father, my grandfather uh, was inspired enough to uh, pack them and put them somewhere in the attic. And we found them later. Sorry for the Romanian, only now I realize so uh, I let them. On the left side, it's uh, with one of his sisters before getting married. And on the right side with my grandmother on their wedding day, this was uh, February 47. And this is my grandmother a photo, yeah, taking way later in uh, 2012. She died uh, two years ago. In December will be two years actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I'm glad you talked about this. There was one of the question uh, that asked about how you how you actually gathered all these pictures from the family and so on. And so one of some the answer was in fact that some of them came from the secret police files and others were hidden by your grandfather in the attic and so on. Yeah, yeah. this is also interesting how the life of the photographs, some family photographs that uh, uh, gained the political meaning and ended up in the political file and uh, the opposite, some uh, political uh, photographs uh, that were actually became family photographs, uh, mm -hmm. such as this with the children that uh, of course, I took it from the Securitate files and uh, it ended up in a family album, although it's a political photograph, mm -hmm. but it's the only photo with uh, uh, my father and his sister as children. I don't know if I mentioned before, but it was taken by, the, by an informant, mm -hmm. actually, who was paid for it. If you ask me, I have no idea why it was relevant, no idea whatsoever, but it was a piece of information that was paid for. So. The guy got some money for it. Yes, thank you. So there is another question about uh, your comments regarding the regime of Nicolae Ceausescu and whether the resistance played any role in his demise. Of course, the time is different in a sense in which Ceausescu came much later, but maybe some connection over time of the, I don't know, maybe hope, the hope that they continue to keep. But anyway, I'll I let you talk about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated um context, uh, the fall of communism, it's a very complicated context and uh, I know that everybody knows probably the fall of uh, the Iron Curtain uh, and this domino of uh, 1989. Uh, we are talking about the 1950 uh, and uh, Ceausescu was not in power at the time. He came much later in uh, 1965. The resistance was uh, extinguished uh, by the end of uh, the 50s. So 15 years, no, uh, five, sorry, five years 
uh, before Ceausescu came into power. And uh, with him, it started another stage of communism. Uh, he wanted to be a more uh, open to the West leader or to pose as. And then the historical depths of the country that he was crazy enough to try to pay in a very short time, which brought some a lot of shortage and famine basically in the country in the 80s. But of course, if you want to see it uh, in this way, I think that uh, the resistance itself and the fact that uh, it continued, because uh, armed resistance is only one part of general resistance. There was resistance to culture, there was uh, there were all sorts of other events that can be related to resistance in Romania uh, during communism, not only this small part. This is a case study, if you, you want, it's micro history. But uh, while doing this, I wanted to um, show uh, the legacy uh, of communism and uh, to trace a bit uh, what it happened, what uh, it means for um, Com for a community, what is at stake when we talk about this period? Why is it important to know? Because we cannot understand the nowadays society without understanding uh, what happened 50 years ago. Uh, these people, some of them are still alive. They form our society. Uh, these people, when I say these people, I mean everybody, <laughs> informants, uh, partisans, uh, descendants of the partisans, descendants of the informers. And then we are talking also about the polarization and the division that uh, happened in the 50s and continued and we are still facing it. Uh, the trauma that we need to heal and we all need to heal it and to integrate it and to know it. The identity, the um, traumatic amnesia that uh, some of us are still facing and also yeah and so on well thank you for for this comments because they allow me to ask perhaps a final question uh you talked uh quite uh, a lot about trauma and about uh division in a, in a country and about the fact that to some extent we can portray romanian society as a society that went through a disease and uh, is going to attempt at least or to go through some sort of healing and uh, as i'm sure you are all aware and uh, including the participants many people talk about a strong division nowadays including in the us but also not in the us only but throughout the world the division between uh, the views of people have or the views of people have been radicalized and the division is such that we have in a we are in a situation in which it's hard to continue having a, any kind of dialogue so do you think that romania has any lessons for or the his not romania itself but the history of romania what romania went through can give us any lessons for today about how we can heal a society that is in conflict and a society that is difficult to to bring at peace even at Thanksgiving tables. Well, we are far from being healed, so I don't know if we can be an example of good practices. Um, but maybe we can look at the Romanian experience and at the recent past uh, and understand how important it is to heal and how impossible it is to heal without standing at this reconciliation table. And uh, we can maybe it can be an invitation to look a bit more at the person than uh, at the ideology or at the reason uh, of the fight. Because now I, both in my research and in my personal encounter with these people, I am thinking less of uh, right and wrong and uh, who was good and bad and black and white, because I think that it's absolutely irrelevant. Uh, but uh, how you can reach the other and how you can uh, continue with the other because you are connected to the other. There is no other way. Uh, what can we do now to kill all informants? They are our neighbors, our friends, our, uh, I don't know, <laughs> our kids, uh, playmates, and um, who cares? So, I mean, I think it's more important to... Uh, 
start a dialogue and also to look a bit uh, not only at the this this fight objectifies people in a sense and the polarization uh, splits us in categories we we have this polarization in Romania on various topics uh, nowadays and I think it's happening all over the world and uh, people are more and more divided and we forget uh, during I think this this division is more dangerous than uh, anything maybe and we are trying to overcome it by understanding also the suffering of uh, the other nobody jumps to fight and to kill the other category if he's not suffering himself in a way or another, you know, for a reason or another. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. And uh, uh, I will ask you if you do not mind to stop sharing uh, the power. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, just, just for the end, so to say. But yeah. I want, again, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. I know that in Romania it's almost 11 p.m. And I know that you have two young and beautiful children. Hopefully who are sleeping. I think Angela is recording and non-recording at the same time. So thank you very much for uh, for what I think it's a wonderful speech. And I thank you at the same time for being in class. As I didn't, I didn't mention at the beginning, but this is actually a class in the sense in which it is a class organized at Methodist College and we open it, so, so to say, to the community. And Joanna has been a guest speaker in classes before. Uh, thank you again, Angela, for... Uh, for organizing this and for uh, hosting us, and I let you have the last questions. And the last, the last, uh, <laughs> yeah, questions. no questions. One, the words the well. last word. Yeah. On behalf of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council and Methodist College, thank you very much, Ioana. This has been a very enlightening and very engaging conversation about a, a difficult period in our history and, and the ways that we should look at it as it goes on today. Everyone, uh, remember that on Sunday we have a special program with um, uh, Adario, the photojournalist on Afghanistan. So you can find registration for that on the website www.pawac.org and join us for a conversation with um, one of the leading photojournalists from her time in Afghanistan. Have a terrific weekend. And thank you again, Joanna. Thank you, Tavi. And thank you, Methodist College, for sharing such a great program with the Peoria Area World Affairs Council. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know.